But if, you've been, if you know you've been placed here by God to do an assignment and he said, I'll be with you till we get it done, and you believe that the word of God is stronger than any word from hell, and you believe that light is stronger than darkness, and you believe that truth wins out over deception, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross and that his blood bought and paid for everything sin tainted, you cannot just be wanting to get out of here. So I wrote a book back in the, whenever that left behind stuff was, and I wrote a book called Glad to be Left Behind. It, it didn't sell all that many. There's a lot to cover. I told Chris when they came in, after he had asked me to cover so many things, I said, I need two hours. I don't, don't think we have that long, but uh, if you'll listen quick, I'll try to talk quickly. How's that? Uh, I do want to go to the scripture because uh, that's where our hope is found in Christ. And he is the living word and he has given us the written word and so we can know him. So turn with me in your text, what, however you do that, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, I don't hear a lot of pages turn. Uh, I'm not teasing. I want you to look at it. Well, we'll have it on the board, but that, that really kind of spoils you. You get to looking up there and then you don't look at your own scripture. Okay, however you do it. This is a letter of Peter, the Apostle Peter, as he is writing to Christians somewhere around 74, excuse me, 64, 65 AD. Jesus has come. He's fulfilled Old Testament promise and prophets. He has died on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit has been sent by the Father and by the Son to the church on the day of Pentecost. And the church has been, began to spread. Persecution began to arise uh, because the Jews hated the, this group that had come out believing in the Messiah because it was not their story. So the Jews were persecuting the believers and Rome began then also to persecute them as well. So they were facing persecution on every side. They were also facing confusion because you see, uh, Jesus had been, uh, Jesus was a Jew. He was an Israelite. The very first people of the church were Israelites. The, the disciples were Israelites. So the church was born in the root of the fulfillment of God's purpose for Israel. And yet some Gentiles have begun to come in. And so there was a mixture of, in the church, of Jews and Gentiles. And there was confusion about who are we? Who is this new band of people on the earth? They were called by various names. Some called them the way. Uh, at Antioch, the, somebody finally said, let's call them Christians because they follow Christ. So they're Christians, Christians. So that's how that name got started. But there was confusion about their identity as the people of God. Who were they? They weren't Israel. They, they weren't some other religion. Who are these people? And so he is writing to these people in the midst of persecution and in the midst of confusion. Does anybody see any connection between them in that day and us in our day? Okay, so I want to read a text that he is writing to that group of people. And I'm not going to take it apart verse by verse, which I would love to with you. That's like letting you go into the lab and working out the stuff. I am going to take the summary of it and the truths that it teaches and talk to you about it. I double dog dare you to take your scriptures sometime today or tomorrow and read it and see if what I say did not come out of that scripture. So what I'm saying to you did come out of the scripture, okay? 
Now let's read it, starting with verse chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Pause. Hold your finger there. It doesn't mean you got to go to heaven to get it. It means heaven's forces keep it. Unless you're bigger than heaven, you can't get to it. It's kept in the heavenly dimension for you. You can have it now, but it's kept by the powers of heaven, is what he's saying. Who by God's power, verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. Not only is your inheritance uh, kept, you're kept, it says. Kept by God's power, being guarded through faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated, was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. We are living in a day, uh, according to the uh, surveys that are done, of unprecedented hopelessness in our country at least since the Civil War. There is an epidemic, a pandemic, if you will, of hopelessness, purposelessness, angst, anxiety. I know it will thrill you to know that our federal government has recognized this need and has decided to create a department to deal with the loneliness problem in America. I know that will thrill you. Uh, it was the policies of the federal government that created much of the loneliness as we destroyed the family and connections and so forth. So anyway, I won't, I won't go there. I will tell you that there is hope. It says in this passage that what God has done creates us to live in a living hope with an inexpressible joy and an unfading peace. So if we get what God says and we embrace it, we do not have to fear the times in which we live. Okay, so let's take their situation in their culture and compare it to ours. They were persecuted and they were confused. We are living in a time when there's a battle between two religions. Those religions are secular, secularism and Christianity. Those two religions are battling for America and for Western civilization and actually the whole world. Uh, secularism is the belief that you can be moral or have some sense of morality without God. You don't need God. You can just figure it out on your own, and you can come up with some semblance of order or some structure whereby 
society can flourish. Uh, can't happen. But that is what we're being taught. So let's get rid of God in everything, and then we can figure it out on our own. So that's, uh, that's the battle. <clears throat> N.T. Wright, who is uh, one of the most respected theologians of our day, probably the most popular writing theologian, has said that there are three things that are necessary, the very basic, uh, irreducible minimum of things that, that must be believed if society can sustain itself. Those three things are, are y'all ready to take notes? Yeah. Okay, those three things are, you must celebrate creation. If you, uh, if you don't believe that there, there was a creator and that creation is a reflection of him, and that it has order to it, and that God created creation with an order. If you don't believe that, then you have no basis of a society. Well, we are being taught that, and have been being taught that for a long time. Evolution, at least secular evolution, teaches that there is no creator, and that there is no order, and that we have to create our own order, and it comes out of us. That is, a, uh, that is destroying the foundation of any rational, hopeful belief. The second uh, thing that a society must believe, if it's to sustain itself, is we must contemplate the depth of the brokenness in creation. In other words, what, what got in creation that messed things up so badly? We are being taught that uh, that there's nothing, nothing wrong with creation that time won't fix because we are inevitably moving in a progressive uh, state of things are getting better. That's why you hear things like, you know, be on the right side of history. And uh, if we, there's a reason we celebrate the LBGTQ plus deal is like, okay, we finally have gotten to the place in our development of humanity that now we are taking all the restrictions off and all of those old standards and regulations and definitions and so forth. We're taking all that off so that mankind can finally blossom and he will then produce a, a, a level of flourishing society that's greater than anything religion could have ever had to do with. So the, the belief that we're progressively getting better, and, and it's seeped into the church so that so much of the uh, preaching in uh, the last 50 years or more has been more about how we could all get better. Uh, let's, let's try to be better people. Let's try to be slimmer and let's try to eat better. Let's try to exercise more. Let's try to be better in our skills. Let's be better, uh, better to each other. Let's, uh, you, you, it's not better that you need. It's a start over that you need. You see, the scripture teaches us that sin came into this beautiful creation that God created and sin totally depraved it, deprived it. That there is working in society apart from the eradication of it by the death of Christ, that there's working in society an evil, a malignancy that's worse than cancer and that it will destroy everything it touches. And so sin has destroyed, has, has touched, tainted everything. It tainted Adam and Eve. It tainted their kids. It tainted society. It taints government. It taints education. It taints everything. So sin un, un, uh, eliminated, unaddressed, will continually destroy a society. And it has faced everything. Uh, I mean, it has touched everything. So uh, if you don't believe that in sin, that is, if you don't believe that evil is a real reality and that it is working its, uh, working its magic in our culture, then you will not want a Savior. You don't think you need a Savior. You won't believe in a Savior. And you will reduce any talk about Savior to some uh, irrelevant religion. So uh, 
we're not contemplating the depth of our of our sin. Uh, and then the third thing is, if it's a minimum belief, if you're going to have a society that sustains itself, you must not only uh, celebrate creation and contemplate the brokenness of creation, you must anticipate that there's coming a day when the best is yet to come. If there's not a conclusion, if there's not a time when God sets wrong right, then there's no basis for hope. So if it's like, okay, uh, it's just going to continue on till it all, we don't know. Uh, that that uh, does not allow you to survive. Okay, those are the basic minimums. And uh, we have been uh, we have been infected by by that kind of thinking. Uh, let me mention two things that uh, have affected us where you and I live. This is just us talking about us. Okay, we live in a, a, a time after the uh, after the proclamation and the spread of a theological or at least a biblical structure, a theological system called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism uh, basically got started in the 1830s. John Nelson Darby was, uh, was a Plymouth Brethren, and uh, he came up with a way of approaching Scripture that uh, basically was a reaction, it seems, to the kind of spiritual, allegorical interpretation of Scripture. So he came up with a deal of, if you're going to read Scripture, it has to be plain, simple, flat, literal interpretation. There can be no typology. There can be no projections. You have to take the Bible for what it says right here. If it says land, it means land. It cannot mean something greater if it says a temple, it must mean that temple. It can't mean something greater. So it eliminates, it eliminates the fact that the Old Testament is, a project, is projecting something that's going to happen in the future and that Jesus is a fulfillment of things that were natural in their beginning but become something greater later. So he adopted this flat literal interpretation and in doing that, he concluded that there are two peoples of God in the Bible. They are the natural people of God, Israel, and then there are the spiritual people of God, the church. Those are two distinct people, and their promises don't mix. Then when God says something to Israel, it has to be fulfilled in Israel. And if God says something to the church, it will, be, it will be about their heavenly, their spiritual relationship. So that has created a confusion amongst the people of God, particularly in our part of the world. Dallas Theological Seminary became a hotbed of that teaching early on in its beginning. And Dallas Theological Seminary is a prominent the, uh, theological training center. It's produced many people who are God-loving people, good, good Christians, good Bible teachers, whatever. But that was, a, that, that was a teaching as a part of that seminary. It also was picked up by people like uh, Dwight L. Moody. And then it was most made popular when C.I. Schofield from Dallas uh, wrote a Bible, or wrote the notes to a Bible. He puts his notes about how to interpret Scripture and how to define who the people of God were in that Bible, the Schofield Bible. Uh, that was uh, highly uh, popular, and a lot of people took that, and they took Schofield's notes and read them as if they were as authoritative as the Scripture itself. But they were his notes about it. They were his opinion, his, his stuff. And so it became, uh, it became popular in the United States primarily 
uh, not so much in Europe or anywhere else, but in the United States, it became popular to say, if you don't believe in this particular method of interpretation, you don't believe the Bible. So those who would take another view and go, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's what the scripture says. I don't, I don't think it says that God has two peoples, you know, a natural people and a spiritual people. I, it's like, well, uh, you're a liberal. You don't believe the Bible. Okay. So that's unfortunate, but that, that did happen. And uh, so that system of interpretation is what I call a cut and paste system of interpretation. It is kind of the belief that the Bible is just inspired writings and, and it's okay to take any piece over here and push it over here and put it together and it's all still Bible. And so you just basically take tr transcendent statements. You can take something out of the Old Testament and mix it with something in the New Testament, whatever, and you come up with a system of, of belief. Well, you can imagine how confusing that is. That the, the Bible then becomes like a puzzle that you put together. And guess what? You get all, everybody together in the same room. Everybody puts together the puzzle different. No wonder we're fussing about it. No wonder we're, it's controversial. No wonder it's confusing to us. And so, uh, you know, it's like a friend of mine was a total pagan and, uh, he, he was in Las Vegas and he was driving down the road and he saw a sign that says, Jesus saves. And he said, I thought, oh, what does he say? Coupons? Uh, uh, okay, so you, well, it is, you and I know the context. Jesus saves. He saves us from our sin. He saves, but if you take the Bible like that, like the Bible is just full of those kind of statements and just say, oh yeah, it says this right here. So, so that goes over here and that goes over here and that goes over here. Uh, one of the professors at Dallas Theological Seminary, a good friend of mine, I was asking him, I said, what's your view on the whole thing? And he said, well, dispensationalism, it may be right, but you can't find it in the Bible. <laughs> I agree with that. Unless you cut and paste. Because the story of the Bible is, doesn't say that. The story of the Bible doesn't say God has two different people. God, God has always had one people. He chose Israel because he wanted Israel to be the instrument through which the ultimate seed would come that would save all people and restore all creation. And so... Israel, finally, out of Israel came, out of ethnic Israel came an Israel that believed God, and out of that remnant came a seed that was the ultimate Israelite, Jesus, who was, who was, Jew, who was Israel in one person. He fulfilled everything God asked Israel to do, paid the penalty of being a priest and paid the penalty for the sins, fulfilling the covenant, was raised from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, sent his Holy Spirit back to be in both Jews and Gentiles, making a whole new one, a one new person, tearing down the walls of all racism, ethnicity, and every other distinction, and making one people of God on the earth. That's the biblical story. It would help to hear a little more. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, so we have a lot of confusion about that. And as I said, a lot of really good people have, uh, have bought into that whole thing. There's a new book out if you want to get really serious about studying this called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, uh, written by a historian out of the uh, University of Wisconsin. And he, his basic point in the book, and it's an excellent book to read, is that though dispensationalism is going, is being more and more rejected by seminaries and theologians and scholars, its effect is still in America big time. We've all been affected by it. And it's true. I have, you have, the whole, the whole deal. And, and one of the confusions of it is, 
dispensationalism creates such a complicated system, none of us think we can figure it out. I, I can remember when I was in seminary, my wife was uh, you know, working, putting us through seminary, and I was going to seminary. I'd come home at night. She thought she had a right for me to tell her what I was learning. Uh, and her questions would be about, often about second coming. So like, explain to me now about, you know, the rapture and the tribulation and like who can be saved during the tribulation, who can't. And tribulation, that's for Jews or that's for everybody. And the battle of Armageddon, like, okay, now Jesus is going to come back and he is going to kill, uh, like, uh, I, I mean, first of all, two thirds of the Jews are going to get killed. That doesn't sound good to Jews for me, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, the nations are going to come against Israel and they're going to destroy. And then Jesus is going to appear in the middle of the battle of Armageddon. And then he's going to be the savior. And so then he'll go and he'll rule in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, she said, now, now explain that to me. And uh, first of all, uh, what, where, where are the Gentiles in the middle of this whole, whole deal? And, and, uh, Okay, uh, does that mean that a, a that that Jew at that particular time can be saved by a Messiah that never did go to the cross, that he just came and defeated the enemy in a military deal? I mean, it sounds like they're bypassing. And she'd get me so confused. <laughs> and so I'd say, well, honey, I, I'll ask again tomorrow. And so... <laughs> We get in the coffee shop after the class, you know, and I go, hey, guy, explain this to me again. <laughs> and we'd get the charts out, and they'd show the charts, and i go, okay, I, I got it now. I think I got it. So I'd go home, and I'd say, okay, Betsy, listen now. Here's the way it works. And so I'd try to lay it out, and she'd go, that doesn't make any sense. What about this, and what about that, and what about this? And it's like, oh, I don't know, baby. <laughs> well, listen, y'all, the Bible wasn't intended to be that kind of, that kind of complicated. So here's what we've done. The church allowed the controversial nature of it to cause us to back away from it and not deal with it. I tell you, when I had to start dealing with it, I was pastor of a church in the 70s when the Jesus movement hit. In the Jesus movement, kids were being saved all hours of the day and night. And uh, in, in a church I was pastoring, we had an extra youth building, and so we let them meet whenever they wanted to. I would often get calls like 1 o'clock in the morning, Saying, uh, Pastor Dudley, uh, so and so just got saved, and we need you to come down and baptize them. <laughs> well, these are usually Church of Christ kids, you know, coming out of Church of Christ Church, believe you have to be baptized instantly, otherwise you're not fully saved. And I'd say, I'll do it Sunday. And they go, No, you can't do it Sunday. It's it's only Wednesday. They could die between now and then. <laughs> and I'd say, Well, call you a Church of Christ pastor. He'll he'll come do it. I'm, I'm not coming. Uh, but I would go down and meet with them, sit with them as they were, you know, they were so excited and whatever. But at that same time, Hal Lindsey came out with a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, in which he adopted the dispensational view, which is really complicated. And his whole deal was Israel as a nation was reestablished in 1948. Jesus said, this generation will not pass away until he comes again. So Without setting a date, he set a date and said Jesus would be back before 1988. So he said to those kids, he was saying to the, everybody, but the kids picked up, okay, we're the terminal generation. We're the last generation on earth that will be here. There's, there's no need to go to school. There's no need to learn to handle your money. There's no need to learn how to have skills of, of social relationships. There's no need to learn whole, all, the rest of the Bible. It's all about let's get a few people saved because Jesus is coming back in the next few days. And I was having to try to pastor these kids who were, but Hal Lindsey sold five zillion million of those and said he's got to be right. No, he's wrong. Good man, wrong. You can be a good man and be wrong, right? So the church had basically, and I was guilty too, had said it's controversial. I can't figure it out. So I'm going, I'm going to ignore it. Uh, no, it could be controversial because it's important. It is important about how you live. 
It may not determine whether you go to heaven or not go to heaven, but it, it, it'll determine whether or not you have hope or not. So I said, okay, I'll get in and I'll start studying it. And when I, when I began to just say, I'm going to let the scripture speak to me, I'm going, I'm going to let the story dictate to me what the whole thing is, I did not come out anywhere close to dispensationalism. Don't think you will either. Uh, because the, the scripture teaches a hope. Well, there's still a lot of teachers around, good people, some of, them, some of them are really good people. Some of them may be not as good as others, like everything, but, and they're still promoting this. You know, Jimmy Evans is a good friend of mine, but he is promoting stuff uh, that I don't think builds hope. I don't recommend it. Uh, Dr. J David Jeremiah is a wonderful pastor, great preacher. I uh, appreciate him and love him. I, I just noticed the other day he's coming out with a, new book called The Deliverance, and it's all about the rapture and about how we all, you know, we're going to be sitting in the classroom, people are going to disappear, and people are going to be driving down the road and dis disappear. This happened, you know, I remember all this stuff back in the 70s, and and, and then the, the Left Behind series that happened a few years ago. It's all about escapism. Well, if you're hopeless, escape looks really good. But if, you've been, if you know you've been placed here by God to do an assignment and he said, I'll be with you till we get it done, and you believe that the word of God is stronger than any word from hell, and you believe that light is stronger than darkness, and you believe that truth wins out over deception, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross and that his blood bought and paid for everything sin tainted, you cannot just be wanting to get out of here. So I wrote a book back in the, whenever that left behind stuff was, and I wrote a book called Glad to be Left Behind. It, it didn't sell all that many. But now I can't get enough to get to fill the orders. Uh, I may need to rename it or something. I don't know. But, uh, so I'm just saying I, I, I sympathize with you. I've been, I, I've been a part of the confused. But the Bible is not confusing and it is not fear creating. We have not received a spirit of fear. We, we don't need to be looking for a great snatch from the sky. We need to be looking for the living hope that we have, believing that there is coming a day when God will culminate everything he bought and paid for in Christ Jesus. Okay, how much time do I have? It's 11.17. Okay, so all of that's kind of setting the stage, Okay. Uh, the, the, the message won't be as long as the introduction. <laughs> That's living hope. <laughs> or deception. <laughs> uh, I quoted it into your right earlier. Let me, let me quote Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was probably the greatest theologian that was ever produced in the United States. And uh, Jonathan Edwards had a sermon called The Happiness of God. Now that contradicts contradicts a lot of people's concept of Jonathan Edwards because I don't think he was ever happy. He, he did his famous sermon. Are y'all going to watch that now? <laughs> going to be a distraction to you. In other words, I'll put it in my pocket if it is. Um, his famous sermon was uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Most people just know the title. They never read a sermon. And all he's saying is that, well, it's not all he said a lot. It's a great sermon. But all he's saying is that, uh, that God cannot overlook sin and that the wrath of God does come on sin, which is true. But anyway, I'm not trying to defend Jonathan Edwards. He defended himself. But he had a sermon called The Happiness of God. And in it, he said, there are three foundational truths that if you will, if you will believe them, and they're true, they're biblical revelation, 
If you believe these three things, you can have hope in any circumstance, at any time, in any situation. And this text that I have read to you today contain those three. So here they are. God turns all bad things to good. He's been doing that since the beginning. He takes all bad things and turns them to good. You know why? Because God's nature is mercy. That's his nature. In order for that nature to be displayed, there has to be a mess because mercy only shines in a mess. So there had to be a fall in the garden in order for God to have a restoration. Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God had decided before creation that man would fall. He what? God didn't make him fall. God had decided he would fall and that in the fall he would bring a restoration and that out of the natural creation of the Garden of Eden, there would one day be a new heaven and a new earth that would be greater than anything that was created to begin with. Every story in the Old Testament is God taking something bad and turning it to good. So Israel, well, the temple was a big deal in the Old Testament, as you know. So God lets Babylon come and destroy the temple. Then later, he lets the children of Israel go back out of uh, captivity and they go back to Israel and start rebuilding things. And it never gets really all that great. Herod, when he comes along years later, kind of restores it. But then Jesus comes. He goes into the, to the temple that looks great by this time and overturns everything and says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it. And, and that blew their mind. It took hundreds of years for us to build his temple. He wasn't talking about that temple. He's talking about one that was better. Which is better? For there to be a temple in Jerusalem where people from all over the world have to go and meet God, or there to be a temple that's mobile where God has come and gotten inside of people and made each believer a living stone in the temple and then sent that temple into the world. Amen. That's what Jesus was doing in the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now I'm sending you out. Go out and be the temple so that any spot on the earth, people can come and meet God as you preach the gospel and their sins are forgiven. Everything in the, in the Bible is about the God of mercy showing up and taking something bad and making it good. And the good is always better than the original. Has God done that in your life? You may be going through some bad things right now. I am. And it's like, hurry, Lord. I know that you don't allow any mess to come, that you don't have mercy that's greater than the mess. But right now I'm in the mess. I have hope. Because there's nothing in my life that was created by sin or by selfishness or by a fallen nature or by fallen creation. There's nothing that's not going to be fully restored. Y'all are saying that pretty tentatively. That's really important that you believe that. Why? This, this text says God caused us to be born again. <laughs> what God starts, God finishes. He has never started anything he doesn't finish. And just because there's a delay doesn't mean it's denial. And so get your, get your head up, get your hope up. The God of mercy is your God. And if you look behind you, mercy is chasing you. Goodness and mercy shall chase me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, said the psalmist. Okay, second one. These are things that if you will embrace, 
allow you to have hope in any situation. God turns all bad things good. Number two, you can't lose anything you got by grace. You cannot lose anything God's ever given you. Because see, grace means God started it and it wasn't you that caused him to give it. It was him that caused, that caused the gift. We sang about it all day today. Jennifer led us in, in, in worship. It's his faithfulness. It's his promise that I'm trusting, not my ability to believe it. Am I going to be able to last to the end? Yes. Mm, only because he does. Amen. My inheritance is tied up in him. How secure is that? Well, it says all the angels in heaven are protecting it. And I'm protected by him. And so I cannot lose anything that was given to me by grace. I can't lose my sonship. I can't lose my forgiveness. I, 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 you say, well, what if you sin again? Uh, I'll be forgiven again. I, I can't lose it because God didn't give it to me based on my merit. And, and so if, if I didn't merit it the first time, I can't unmerit it. So you can't lose it. You can't lose your inheritance. You can't lose. You are the people of God. Amen. You, you, you get all the promises that God promised to Israel as a type. You get it in the fulfillment. He promised them that they would have a land. <laughs> you, you, you can quit fighting over that land over there. That's not the inheritance. It's better. Remember, he, turned, he takes bad things. It's better. Do you know what we get? A new heaven and a new earth. Y'all don't believe that. <laughs> Book of Romans, Paul says to Abraham, everything God promised to Abraham, you get, and that includes the whole world. Not the little piece of land over there we call the Holy Land. The whole world. Why? Because Jesus' blood bought and paid for the whole thing. He didn't just bought and pay for that. He bought and paid for the whole thing. Now, parentheses here. There's one comment. Uh, Dr. Rutland already dealt with it last week. I, I listened to that. Uh, what's going on right now in the war? is not a battle between Israel and Palestine, the Palestinians. It's a battle against Israel and Hamas. That is a terrorist organization. That is sheer evil. That is the ultimate of evil on, on our earth. The battle is not against two nations. It's a battle against Israel and a terrorist organization, just like it was a battle for us in 9-11, against a terrorist organization, not against the world. The, the, the Israelis and the Palestinians need to treat each other with justice and all kinds of stuff, but that's a whole other issue. Hamas is evil. Hamas is a terrorist deal. Israel has a right responsibility to stop that from destroying their citizens and whatever. Do not be drawn into that argument of, yeah, but uh, Israel's done bad things and the Palestinians done bad things. And so this is a tit for tat. No, it isn't. No. No, it's, uh, it's something totally different. Okay, so that's enough on that. Uh, you can't lose what God has given you. And the last thing is, and we quit here, the best is yet to come. What, listen to me really carefully. What Jesus bought and paid for on the cross, what he accomplished on the cross is going to be fully manifested in this earth. Now, I know you, like, like I, have heard songs about heaven and about flying away and being on a cloud and all that kind of stuff. I... It's bigger than that. It's better than that. But 
But Jesus did not die and pay for us to just escape here and this whole world to be left or destroyed. He bought and paid for the restoration of all things. We've been restored in our spirit. We've been forgiven. We've been made sons of God, children of God. We've been made ambassadors. All that's already, already happened. But there's coming a day when everything sin tainted will be untainted and be restored. And we will live on this earth where God has made all wrongs right. And he's made all sadness become untrue. Several weekends ago, I was down in Bosque County, and we had the privilege of hearing the sheriff of McClellan County uh, lecture us on some of the history of law enforcement and so forth. Uh, I didn't know it, but he's one of the more popular sheriffs in the country, only to the guy in Maricopa County in Arizona, I think, because he's chased down so many serial killers and caught them. And uh, so he was telling us a story of of chasing down Macduff, the guy who was so popular, movies have been made about him, books have been written about him. He's the one who caught him, but he was uh, he was he was an evil person. He would he would uh, take girls and torture them, and he would. The sheriff was very vivid, though not crude, in telling us what he did to them, and it was it was sickening. And uh, and he talked about that and uh, the whole thing about how many had found how many they don't know they found, whatever. And uh, I was in a group of uh, couples. Uh, I didn't have a couple, but I was with a couple. (laughs) And I was watching the ladies, and I could tell that they were being uh, moved. And I was, as I thought about those little girls and the injustice of that and these little 13, 14-year-old girls who never get to live a life and, and get married and have a baby and have a family. And I, I, was, I was hurting. <laughs> so I left the group and went back to the bunkhouse and just sat there and I just said, God, I, I don't know how to deal with that kind of evil. And uh, uh, called an epiphany of vision, I don't know whatever, but the Lord showed me showed me that day that's depicted in Revelation 21, 22. That there's going to come a day when those little girls get it all back. Because God, by his, because he's a God of justice, he's God faithful to his promise. And he's a God who claims what he bought and paid for. Every wrong is going to be made right. Every one of them. I don't know how it's going to work. Obviously, John didn't know how it's going to work. He wrote it in symbolic language, so you know we just got pictures. I don't know. Those little girls will get it back. Those babies that are being beheaded in Palestine, Palestine, Israel, wherever. This thing's not going to finish with evil winning because Jesus defeated evil on the cross. The best is yet to come. We will see a new earth, a new heaven, and you can live on that hope.